Thanks, Bill and Nick. If this gave you a picture of the, uh, of the, the wide view of the transformation of all government data, we're going to now focus back in on federal spending and the Data Act mandate. And I'm excited to uh, call our next panel to the stage. Uh, Craig Clay of R.R. Donnelly, uh, one of our partner sponsors today. Bob Taylor of the Treasury Inspector General's Office. Peg Gustafson, the Inspector General of the Small Business Administration. Ali Ahmed of the House Oversight Committee staff. And Amy Edwards of the Senate Budget Committee staff. If we have a mandate, if we put someone in charge of transforming federal spending, it will be most durable if the inspector general community and the members of Congress who passed the mandate pay attention to it. That is what the job of these people up on the stage will be. We're going to have Jason Miller of Federal News Radio moderating, but I want to first turn the podium over to Craig Clay for the welcome. Please welcome all of them. Thank you. Thank you. As the industry leader in integrated communications, R.R. Donnelly has an unwavering dedication to innovation, service, and quality. R.R. Donnelly is proud to serve 100% of the Fortune 100 and 97% of the Fortune 1000. We are the partner of choice for 60,000 clients across four continents uh, and in 37 countries. As the only XBRL software provider in production with major government, government regulators um, across the US, Europe, and Asia, um, Donnelly understands the forthcoming challenge uh, with the Data Act. Here in the US, we've helped the FDIC and the Federal Reserve Bank transform their reporting process to an open standardized data system. Before the Donnelly solution, there were 8,000 banks that were filing quarterly FDIC reports with 3,000 data points using six different systems. Due to the error rate, it took the FDIC 60 days to vet and publish the data. In contrast, the new system using Donnelly technology includes the infrastructure for taxonomies, built-in validations to flag errors, um, all of this before submitting. The FDIC reports are now available on the FDIC repository website uh, within two days, a 58-day improvement. At last Friday's Data Act Town Hall, Marcel Hemio, the Chief Data Architect for the Bureau of Financial Services said, the Data Act implementation doesn't require changing agencies' existing systems. It's an exercise of mapping the existing data to new standards. Based on our experience, this is absolutely the case. The Data Act will result in greater transparency, accuracy, and consistency while reducing the reporting effort. To help us understand more about the oversight of the Data Act and the Treasury OIG perspective is an esteemed panel of experts. I will now turn it over to Jason Miller of Federal News Radio to introduce our panelists. All right. I don't believe in introductions. You've read their bios, or if you haven't, you should. You should know these people. Uh, thanks to Hudson Hollister. Thanks to all the folks at Data Transparency Coalition. I like moderating panels. It's uh, always nice to be on this side versus on that side once in a while. Um, I am Jason Miller, Federal News Radio's executive editor. They yes, asked, you heard right, 1500 AM, AM. <laughs> you usually make a joke now about AM radio. In fact, I decided to come up with some fun facts about AM radio. The first station appeared. KDKA in Pittsburgh, 1919. Hopefully no one remembers that. The first FM radio station, 1939, 20 years later. So we're older than FM. We're way older than XM, right? Uh, during World War, I, World War I, Congress gave the federal government control over the radio waves, and all commercial and amateur radio innovation stopped. It all was by the government. The government led that. Now, you're thinking that's 100 years ago almost, right? But that was important because after World War I, the Navy tried to take over the radio waves, and actually Congress stepped in and said no, made them give all the stations back that they bought. So those are just a few fun facts about radio. We know that the Internet's cool. We know that XM is fun, but AM is historic. Remember where your button is in your car. We need your listenership. <laughs> all right. So uh, a couple things. Uh, before we get started, uh, the panel is a big panel. We have a sh short amount of time. Hudson's being very mean about the clock. I like to go over. I like to talk a lot. So we're going to be quick, and I'm going to come to you. I have a microphone. And I love Phil Donahue. If you remember Phil Donahue, I will do my best impression without tripping. So once they go through their piece, we're going to get to you. So think of questions. Raise your hand. 
Uh, it's a big audience, so if I can't get to everyone, I will get some help from uh, the folks at the Data Transparency Coalition. Let me just set just a real quick context to our discussion. The Data Act was passed, uh, signed into law in May. In the short time since that happened, I've seen more activity, more excitement maybe, more focus than in seven years of FAFATA. FAFATA, my favorite government acronym, Federal Accountability Transparency Act. I know I'm that much of a nerd. <laughs> FAFATA. All right, so oversight, important. We know that. We know it's got to happen. I think one of the failings of FAFATA, and, and, and maybe people you'll, you'll disagree with me, is that there was not enough oversight. I think why the Recovery Act worked so well is there was oversight, among other reasons. So I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to turn. Let's start with the folks on the Hill first, and then we'll work to the agencies, if that's OK. So uh, I know Ali, if you want to do the ladies first. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for that a speedy introduction. Um, I'm Amy Edwards. I um, am the director of the Government Performance Task Force on the Senate Budget Committee. Uh, and I work uh, for Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, who is the chairman of our Budget Committee Task Force. We're, and we've been really looking at how we improve the information base for decision making in Congress, uh, how we improve the effectiveness and efficiency of federal programs. Um, I think. Wisely, Senator Warner uh, started, you know, we began this effort about five years ago to, because we know that our looming fiscal challenges um, are not going away and having better information and being better informed is an important way to help us figure out um, what, what we need to do moving forward. So um, we've been pleased working on this issue along with our colleagues in the House with uh, Chairman Issa and his staff. This has been an ongoing bipartisan, bicameral partnership since we started. And I think that you know it really has reflected the ability to actually get this done, and uh, I hopefully the, a lot of the excitement that you alluded to. I just want to touch uh, probably on just a few of the priorities that I know my boss has, uh, Senator Warner has, in, in monitoring the Data Act and the oversight that I know will be a focus of, of our work moving forward. You know, passing a bill is a good accomplishment, but I think. That's really when the work begins, as most of you in this room know, and, and we know that very well in Congress, and that we have an important role in providing oversight on this important uh, new law. Um, I think linking the data streams from the budget, accounting, procurement, and grant universe <laughs> is an important number one priority because you know uh, it's the foundation for what we hope the Data Act success will be. And so I mean I think that is something we're monitoring closely getting uh, you know, quarterly, if not more, updates from the teams and the interagency working groups from OMB and Treasury, monitoring that work, which is due out in a year from the day we enacted. So May 2015, we'll be looking to see those results and are really following that really closely. Um, you know, The full disclosure of federal funds and the improvements to USAspending.gov is certainly an important focus of this work and we've been proud you know, we've been happy to hear that um, you know there we can expect to see some incremental improvements to the site and that's something that we're going to be tracking really closely um, the other important component and maybe one of the most important components in addition to taxpayer transparency and access to data for decision makers is really agencies using this information internally to to guide agency operations and finding savings and efficiencies. I mean, I've, I've been happy to hear and, and overhearing uh, conversations with other CFOs and financial management uh, leaders across the government, and they see a real opportunity, and that's something we want to support and, and help. Um, but that being said, all of this, I know, is going to be a challenging process for some agencies. Some agencies are better equipped, maybe, than others to adopt some of the reforms that we've uh, put forward. But uh, you know, we want to be an active partner um, we want to work with you all, but we will be monitoring all of this very closely. And an important part of what we included, which was different from what passed in FAFATA, is we really did put in a strong oversight component with our inspector generals and with GAO. And so I'm very, I'm looking forward to hearing how things are going <laughs> with our colleagues on the stage, because that is really important. It wasn't in the original FAFATA. That's one of the lessons that we've learned over the last um, few years as that implementation is, is advanced. So that's something that I think is also critically important. I'd already, I've heard that there's been already a lot of activity and planning and thoughtful uh, discussions taking place. I'm really pleased to hear that. And um, they're going to be our partners in helping to make sure that 
um, our, our members are, are informed and uh, engaged in the oversight as well. So thank you. All right, great. Now, I had the opportunity to sit down with Christina Ho from Treasury, who I think is going to be here later. I'm not sure if she's here now. It's a lot of people. But if you get a chance to be in her panel, she did a great job in the panel. Uh, I saw her at the Data Transparency, and she survived my interview, or I survived her <laughs> answers. Anyways, it was a great job. I'm going to turn to Ali from uh, Oversight and Government Reform. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, good morning, everybody, and on behalf of Chairman Daryl Issa, I want to thank you for being here and thank you for all that you did to make the Data Act into the Data Law. Woo! Um, That's just me. I don't know. I told you I'm a geek on this stuff. First, I'd like to. Jason did a lot. <laughs> no, uh, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, first, I'd like to sort of co-sign on everything that Amy said, and, and yes, this will continue. I think the bipartisan, bicameral nature of designing and passing the law was has already continued in its oversight, and uh, we're confident it will continue. Um, so sort of touching off what she said, I just wanted to present sort of four key questions. I'd say overall our impression of how the implementation going right now is a positive one. Uh, it's, it's sort of very positive. We had a, the town hall was great. We really like what... Uh, the agencies are saying uh, what what OFFM and uh, Treasury are saying about where they're going with the law and how they interpret it. Um, but the four sort of key questions that at least come up in my mind right now, uh, first would be what Amy mentioned, are the agencies going to use it themselves? The expression, I believe, is are they going to eat their own dog food? Uh, I think it's a little crass, so I will try to do it. Are they going to eat their own cooking? Um, it, it's the key difference between whether this becomes a uh, compliance contractor-driven reporting uh, excursion from, you know, the real work, or whether it really does bring that transformation to how agencies manage themselves, how they oversee themselves, and how oversight entities can oversee them. Um, second, very critical program activity. Another thing that Amy mentioned. What are we going to get in terms of connecting outlays to how program activity spending is reported? Uh, it's probably the biggest gap that exists now. And, uh, you know, we hear from a lot of folks that, well, I don't know that we can connect those two. Uh, I think Congress passed the Data Act and kept that in there, uh, despite some objection uh, from our, our federal partners, for a reason. Uh, we want to see that connection. That's a part of bridging program results reporting through GIPRAMA and GIPRA with the spending information. Uh, the Data Act is transformative. I think we can all agree about that. And that's a transformation, at least from the congressional side, that we, we want to see, but we also want to be flexible in helping agencies get there in the most efficient way possible. Um, the third one, and this came up a lot at the Friday Town Hall, more than I thought it would, was what impact will proprietary identifiers already in use, of course we're talking about the uh, data universal numbering system DUNS, have on um, the ability to comply with the Data Act, and in complying with the Data Act, can we avoid creating new proprietary identifiers with restricted terms? I know uh, the DUNS restrictions uh, cause problems for our IG partners already. Uh, of course, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that recovery.gov is actually going to lose recipient reported information uh, tomorrow, and that rat board folks probably can't be here today because they need to get that off of recovery.gov. Um, hopefully we can get it back in the near future, but unfortunately there's no good news to announce on that front yet. Uh, and the third and final one, uh, visualizations. Uh, is the federal government focused on how to visualize and contextualize the data that's being published, or are they just releasing it and letting outside entities visualize and contextualize it for their own audiences? I don't think it's a something, it's a balance that needs to be struck between the government saying, well, this is how you should understand the data, but if that, over time, it's, it's not there now, but if over time the emphasis becomes, well, let's make sure the data gets out in a way that people can understand it, that is room for, you know, the government to, it is essentially it's kind of a mission creep from the Data Act. I don't see it there now, but it's something that I think Congress will be vigilant in going forward. Um, most importantly, Congress does not know and will never know all of the questions that it needs to be asking, so I'd like to just sort of say it's an open door for you guys to tell us what questions we need to be asking, whether you're government, for-profit, not-for-profit, we want to hear from you. All right. So I know from the being at the Data Transparency Town Hall meeting, the common refrain from a lot of the good government groups was dump DUNS. It, luckily, luckily for the DUNS folks, it did not uh, uh, go on hashtag Twitter or anything like that. It didn't go crazy. <laughs> so um, let me turn over to uh, Peg Gustafson, uh, the IG at the Small Business Administration. 
I will keep this very brief. Um, I'm here not so much, I think, because I'm the Inspector General of the Small Business Administration, but I'm actually the chair of the Legislation Committee for SIGI, which is a statutorily created entity that basically is all of the IGs. And I think we have 72 IGs right now in federal government. It changes. Every once in a while, we notice they get a one vote away. Um, so I'm very um, thankful to be here to actually see meet uh, Ali and um, Amy. We have talked uh, many times and, and email and stuff, but I've actually never been in the same room with them, though I have been able to be in the same room with Hudson. Um, and um, the, the process of the, of the Data Act was a very interesting and I think a very um, good one. It was a very collaborative process. I think it was extremely helpful that you had Chairman Issa, who was very serious about the Data Act. It was something that was very important to him. And Senator Warner, um, who was also very important to him. And of course, as you know, get both, both sides of Congress and both parties by having those two, and I think that was one of the things that quite frankly helped, though it was very much a bipartisan bill. Um, I think it was also helpful to have the Recovery Act that already happened. IGs did play a big role in recovery. Um, the IGs made up the RAP board, and of course, um, the head of the Recovery Board didn't have to be an IG, but it ended up it was, uh, Earl Devaney, who had been the Interior IG, and then Kathy Tai, who was Education IG. So, um, and that was very helpful to us as a community because we were able to have talks about what the oversight should look like, kind of the timings, and just the general considerations that always come into play. So. I mean, as I think Mr. Taylor may talk about, there, the act does very specific, uh, does set out kind of what the IG reviews that have to happen will be, and they're not, they haven't happened yet. Obviously, the data standards have to be issued. There has to be some data, and then there'll be reviews of data. So a lot of the work that will be um, done and published isn't going to happen yet. But I do think that the Recovery Act kind of um, was a model for a process where IGs were having a proactive role to the extent that we can, even though we have to come back and oversee. Um, which I think is a good thing because I think that prevents problems um, in, the, in the future. Now, having said all of that, Treasury is the person that you want to talk to right now because they have such a big role. So if that's okay, I'm going to leave it there. So. All right. And I'll pass it over to Bob. Thank, Thank you. you Peggy. Um, I also attend the uh, town hall last week uh, that was sponsored by Treasury on the Data Act, and which did feature a number of speakers from the transparency community. Uh, the takeaway I had from that is people not only want more data, they want good data. The expectations are very high that the Data Act will finally deliver that. Uh, ICIG oversight is critical to ensure that actually happens. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Section 6 of the Data Act, aptly named Accountability for Federal Funding, calls for IGs to conduct reviews and report to Congress three times over the next six years on their respective agencies spending data and on the use by the agencies of the data standards that will be issued by Treasury and OMB. Under the Act, the three reviews are to be done in consultation with GAO and are to include a statistically valid sampling of spending data submitted to USAspending.gov. The IGs are to specifically assess the completeness, timeliness, quality, and accuracy of the sampled data. Next slide. GAO, likewise, has, will report three times. After reviewing the IG's reports, GAO will assess the completeness, timeliness, quality, and the accuracy of data submitted by federal agencies, and they will also be looking at the implementation of the data standards by those agencies. Next slide. So when these IG and GAO reviews to occur, as Peg mentioned, the first IG report is going to be sometime after the data standards are issued. That is, 18 months after is our first reporting uh, due date which would be November 2016. Sounds like a long ways off, but it'll come much sooner than we ever uh, hoped for. Uh, the other two IG reports will follow two years apart from that. That would be in November 2018 and 2020. Uh, GAO's reporting comes one year after each IG reporting cycle, so GAO will be reporting in November 2017, 2019, and 2021. I do want to point out, however, there is one anomaly in the above timeline that's going to present a challenge to us. That is, if you look on the second line, the latest date agencies are to start submitting spending, spending data is May 2017. However, the first IG reports on spending data are due November 16th, six months before agencies must start reporting. Obviously, this timing anomaly will be something where we need to engage our agencies and our congressional stakeholders, as we are not used to auditing something that doesn't exist. <laughs> so we do have our work cut out for us. Next slide. 
Well, I've just discussed the mandated IG work under the Act. Our office, as the Oversight Agency for Treasury Programs and Operations, has already initiated work to assess Treasury's Data Act implementation activities in the early stages. As shown in the slide, we have two bodies of work currently in progress. One audit actually preceded Data Act and is looking at Treasury's stand-up of a transparency office and Treasury's efforts to improve USAspending.gov. The second body of work is looking at Treasury's plans and actions to implement specific responsibilities under the Data Act, such as working with OMB to develop the data standards. We intend to report periodically on the status of those plans and actions. Next slide. Now to wrap up, I will discuss what we see as the next step for the IG community at large. That is, we plan to convene a working group to start tackling a number of areas. The slide shows a few of the things the working group can undertake. Things like consulting with GAO, developing a common audit methodology for the 72 IGs, and keeping stakeholders informed. Uh, we'll be putting out a call for volunteers in November, and we expect to start work in early January. Uh, we've gotten volunteers already, and we expect the interest to be very high. And that's the conclusion of my remarks. All right, so I'm going to not trip off the stage, and I know Ali and Amy are already thinking about their next uh, technical corrections. Is it on? <laughs> there you go. One, one, there we go. The next technical corrections that they have to do, right? Okay, so questions, a lot of good, a lot of quick. There we go, one in front. Let know who you are, please. Uh, Jim Snyder from ISOLAN. Um, two questions. How are we going to prevent what happened with the SEC standards from happening to the Data Act standards? We're in implementing it, and they're years ahead of where you are. Uh, they had lots of technical problems with, regarding the quality of data and political pushback when it finally got implemented. How, how do you prevent, because that's an analogous type of standards and technology, how, how do you prevent that after tens of millions of dollars of public investment in that data reporting standard? And the second question is, when, if ever, are we really going to get a vendor level um, budget uh, disclosure with um, standardized ven uh, and meaningful uh, vendor disclosure. Just, so it's just like we have these proprietary identif identifiers for the government units at the vendor level to really have meaningful disclosure, they also have to be, uh, have standardized unique identifiers. Do you think that'll ever happen? Uh, so. All right, well, who wants to take the first one? So I think I can, I can take the first one. Um, well, the SEC's uh, challenges and, uh, and work in implementing the uh, interactive data rule over these past, uh, I guess it's been about five years, uh, will certainly inform Data Act implementation. Uh, Scott Boggess from SEC spoke at the Data Transparency Town Hall, and I know it's good to know that they're leaning on him and his experience in crafting this. I think one of the key differences which should make it easier on the government side is that in XBRL, you're talking about uh, designing something that can handle uh, the U.S. gap, which is you can describe what is in your books almost any way you want to. Uh, it needs to be very robust and very broad. In the federal government, we're dealing with a, a different and more standardized set of information that we ultimately want to report in a, and disclose in a structured way. Um, also, uh, it will require uh, maybe the key lesson is that where SEC has failed to exert a strong hand in telling uh, issuers, this is how you need to report, this is wrong, and they've, they've turned that around. Uh, we've done some oversight work, we've uh, been working with them, they've issued their first Dear CFO letter, it's probably two to three years too late, but they're on it now. Um, I think OMB and Treasury will just have to maintain a very strong hand in dealing with the agency so you don't get that same sort of uh, creep where, where they're disclosing in a structured way but in a way that doesn't work with the other structured data. All right, and the second part of the question was about contractor, a uh, universal kind of contractor. Did you guys get that, or is that something we want to take maybe offline? I, I, I don't know if I'm exactly hitting your point. I, I don't, describing it as a vendor level budget disclosure. I mean, we do have unique award identifiers that are required in the Data Act that, re, that are specifically, so we can track each award where the money's going, and, you know, across, so there's one award number for 
every award across the federal government. So, I mean, I think we were trying to address, I think, that concern, and it was something that we did include and was enacted. So, I mean, I think that will, that will give us a lot better, you know, I think that's one of the key findings and ongoing problems with FAFATA is that we didn't have that. Currently, so. currently since FAFATA, the government has also paid handsomely to Dun & Bradstreet for the ability to disclose through USAspending.gov uh, recipient-level DUNS numbers and the parent-level DUNS number, too. Um, it definitely, there, there's a lot of problems with that data set, and that might be what you're getting at, um, but it's just going to have to be something we work at as we look for the next generation identifier, you know, and it's years down the road. Just one point of clarification, USA spending is just a small subset of, of vendors. There's, you know, hundreds of thousands of other vendors that aren't included there for, you know, the budget, the pencil, you know, supply. Right. Like that, yeah. that, yeah. So you're, you're dealing with it. That's and just a time have, set. I mean, we yeah. did include a very broad definition of what federal funds mean, so that we are not just accounting for contracts and grants right. over 25,000 as we did in FAFATA, but this actually includes all government spending by the by the functional category, what we're spending on goods. I mean, those those all of that budget, all of every dollar that we spend should be accounted for on USA spending moving forward. All right, let's have another question here. Hi, my name is Chris Murray. Um, I work for the Department of Defense, small agency. Um, first of all, <laughs> I want to say uh, we eat up the biggest budget. But anyways, um, I just want to say I'm all for this. My command is trying to implement this, but these are some of the things that we're facing. I see it in two parts. Number one, changing the culture, okay, getting these organizations to give up and make their data visible. And second of all, cost. How are we as agencies going to pay for this transformation? Is there going to be any special dollar set aside for this transformation initiative? No <laughs> dollars. <laughs> That's why they gave you three years. Go ahead and say it, Ali. Yeah. Um, I've heard, I've heard Daryl likes to talk that way. The Department of Defense also has you know, additional time under the act uh, because of its uh, obligations under, I guess it was the 2010 uh, Defense Authorization Act to become audit ready by 2017. I understand from some of my other work that you know, we're already dealing with issues with that coming down. But uh, the Department of Defense, you know, thankfully has been undertaking an effort for some years now. And you're going to need larger, more time because of your large and somewhat fractured nature over time in order to change that culture. Um, so, you know, it's really great that you're here and, and being supportive. Uh, in terms of additional funding, uh, you know, we see the data act. What, one, of the, one of the best things we've heard so far out of OMB and Treasury is that this is not going to be a system transformation approach, but it's a data-centric approach to implementing the act. This isn't a large call for a drastic IT overhaul of the federal government. We know that those don't go very well. This is about the way that data is managed. So um, we understand concerns about resources, and that's an ongoing conversation between Congress and the agencies. And I think on the culture side, uh, you know, that's an, an also an equally important issue. And um, sometimes Congress's involvement can help or harm the culture. So I, I think that's something we also are monitoring closely and how we can be helpful. Um, you know, we want to be, but we also understand the challenges and we want to, you know, if there's something going on, knowing about it's helpful. And, you know, if we have some, we expect some challenges with this. And I know it's a big change for some agencies. So. All right. I have one last question, but Bob or Peg, was there anything you wanted to add to that real quick before we jump to the next question? No, I, I think everybody acknowledges this is going to be a long, you know, incremental process. It just by, it, it has to be, because you're right, it's going from something small, even the recovery act, to something much bigger. So, um, All right, last question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, I'm fine with that. All right, excellent. <laughs> Ditto. All right, hold on. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Bernadette Highland from Three Round Stones, and I work on a number of government uh, data transparency initiatives. Um, in comment to the lady who asked the question from DOD, I would say I totally concur. It's a culture change, but a lot of the money, a lot of the spending is going <clears> to, <throat> um, I think, be offset by, in civil government, I work on a lot of projects where their agency is spending, say, $65 million over three years for a data warehouse to maintain a data warehouse. We're able to come in and, and slash several zeros off of that and do that project for about six million dollars. So in talking about DOD budgets, you're talking about even more zeros that can be cut. But to my, my point is, uh, the question or comment I wanted to make is, we all enjoy the benefits of a lot of open source. And I have a long time been a open source advocate and we contribute extensively to some core enabling technology used by the government. I encourage, especially on the heels of the shell shock um, 
uh, malware, uh, or not malware, sorry, shell shock problem that has really upset a lot of systems administrators and affected as many as half a billion servers on the internet, that the government, the U.S. government, is in a very good position to run CIO forums and reach out to the open source community, to the web standards community, specifically the W3C, who sets the standards for use of data on the web, and consult with librarians. There are many, many government librarians who know how to do a lot of what we're now trying to do with data. They've, they're professionals who know how to find data, archive it, and are sensitive to these issues. Um, please don't recreate the wheel. Have CIO forums, and to the vendors, the big vendors in the room, participate in a trade association like Data Transparency Coalition, and no, Hudson did not pay me to say that, but well, I think more has happened in three years because of this Data Transparency Coalition and having Hudson and his team on the feet, in his feet being the, the eyes and ears on the hill uh, to get this stuff done. So please join uh, trade associations. Please participate, government people in standards organizations. Be a voice at the table. I co-chaired co the Government Linked Data Working Group for two and a half years. We only had two agencies, EPA and HHS, represented on it. And we had other government agencies from other parts of the world, um, and that's in a way why they're accelerating uh, this whole movement with open data. So please participate. All right, Hudson. Let's thank our panel.